Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, Hebrews 6, an amazing chapter, um, controversial with many people in different denominations because it deals, oh, we're going to see what it deals with, but many people think that Hebrews chapter 6 deals with once saved, always saved. And the big argument that people fight with that, and we're going to walk through it and see exactly what it says. Um, the one thing that I can assure you of before we walk through this word anybody here do you know you're saved if you know you're saved raise your hand if you know it for certain okay no unwavering in it at all all right so you're settled in that fact uh so i'll ask you you who are saved can you lose your salvation no, no absolutely not there is no way on earth i can lose my salvation me now Everybody in this room, I don't know. You tell me, you guys raise your hand, told me you're saved, right? I don't know that. I can, I can trust God that you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I can trust God that you say, I know I'm saved, and I am settled in that fact. I know I'm saved, and I know I'm going to heaven for eternity. And that is a settled assurance in my soul. And if you have that, you understand what that salvation is. But if you waver in that, if you struggle with that, find difficulty with that, that's where this chapter becomes controversial and people use it in a lot of legalistic uh, religious systems or religious groups to condemn people or to, to warn people of losing their salvation. And that's not what this chapter is about in any way, shape, or form. But it is a warning I've titled this message, Moving Forward, because that's what this chapter is about. Moving on to maturity in the Christian faith, not just sitting there and doing nothing, and especially not going backwards. It's about moving forward, and the writer of Hebrews is saying that. Now, last week, we saw the writer of the book of Hebrews, he gave a stern warning, if you remember what it was, not to become dull of hearing. Not to come to a place where you just click it off. You know, when you were, you were a teenager and your parents came in, they started to tell you how to live your life, and you just went, and you just smiled and looked at them because you just couldn't hear them anymore. Well, the warning is don't do that to the Word of God. Don't do it to God who's giving you the direction you need for salvation. Every week we sit down we walk through the Word. Every week, whatever time it is. And God gives clear direction for how to be saved, for how to be with Him for all of eternity. And the writer of the book of Hebrews, last chapter, is saying, don't become dull of hearing that. Don't think there's some other way. There's some other way to be saved, and I'm going to find it, and that's for sure, and I'll spend my life searching for it when God's saying, here it is, freely offered to you through faith in my Son. And, the, and we know that the, the, Jew, the Hebrews, the Jewish believers that were in Jerusalem at the time were, were drifting back to Judaism for their sanctification. And, it's, and he's saying, don't do that. So today, in chapter 6, he's going to give the Hebrews another warning and an encouragement because they're facing persecution from family, from friends, they're being pressed by people around them to turn from their faith in Christ to go back to Judaism with its rituals. All right, you're a Christian. That'd be like me saying to you, listen, okay, you came to faith in Christ. Now come to the Catholic Church where I grew up and follow these sacraments and follow this Macell, and that's how you're going to stay saved. You don't go back to Judaism to stay saved. You walk by faith in Christ to stay saved, and that's what he's going to get into. So the warning here is 
to grow up into maturity as believers in Jesus Christ. And then the encouragement is going to be to trust in and walk out the promises that God has given you. And he's given to each believer. He's given us unbelievable promises, tremendous promises. But they have to be walked out by faith by us, each and every one of us. So let's look at 6. It says, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instructions about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will do if God permits. That, we'll stop right there. So he... he lays it out. He says, okay, therefore, because of what he just said in chapter 6, I mean 5, and don't forget, the theme of chapter f uh, 1 through 9 is Jesus Christ, our great high priest. So that's the theme of what he's saying. So he says, well, because of what I just said about that, that warning I gave in chapter 5, he says, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So laying, uh, leaving uh, lay, means laying aside. So put aside, now that you're saved and you, you understand really the elementary teachings about Christ, that would be the ABCs of your salvation. You understand the ABCs of your salvation. So if, if spiritual progress is what we're going to walk in, then I've got to learn to leave my Christian childhood things behind me and move forward for spiritual growth. So this is what he's saying here. So the writer of Hebrews, all right, you've learned your ABCs of your Christian faith. You should now be able to move on to maturity. Nobody wants a 50-year-old living a 10-year-old's life. I don't want my son, I love my son, if he wants to come move over, that's great. But I don't want my son living in my house at his age, acting like a three-year-old. Who wants that? Nobody. Nobody wants that. And that's what he's saying about the Christian faith here. Now that you've learned the ABCs of this Christian faith, and he's talking to these, these Hebrews, you should now be able to read the Word of God and apply the things you've learned from God's Word to your own life. How do I press on to maturity? Well, not by reading the Word of God and telling you how to apply it in your life. No, anybody can do that. But I move on to maturity in Christ by reading His Word. Dave, you said it earlier this morning. You read His Word. And then as the Holy Spirit sparks you in that and he convicts you, instructs you, you then apply that to your own life. For instance, people that, that say, well, you know, it's controversial. Should I smoke and can I still be a Christian? Can I drink and can I still be a Christian? Can I watch this movie if it's rated R and still be a Christian and hold on to my and be sanctified with Christ? Stop. Open up his word. And if you're reading his word constantly, he'll apply that. He'll show you, you. I can't sit up here and say, listen, as a Christian, you, you, if you drink, you're going to burn in hell. Is that dead wrong, isn't it? But if I sit here and teach his word, and you're reading his word, and you're convicted by his word, you know what, Lord, that does not belong in my life. And nor do I have the right to say, okay, Ernie, so it doesn't belong in my life, nor should it belong in yours. No. Oh, to move on to maturity as a believer, I pick up the word and I read it. And I should be able to, if I've learned the ABCs of my salvation, and I'm settled in my salvation, I should be able to open up his word and apply it to my life. And that's what he's trying to show these Hebrew believers. You know, a child is taught the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic, not so they can stay in the third grade demanding their own way. They're taught the basics so that from the basics they might learn to go on to better things. Get it? When a builder comes in and he's going to build you a house, what's the first thing he lays down? He lays down the foundation. Then, then what? He moves down the road and builds your house on the ground. Is that how it works? No. He lays the foundation, and then on that foundation, he builds. Where? Up. 
He moves on to maturity. Let's stick frame this thing. Let's insulate this thing. Let's put wires and plumbing in this thing. Let's cap the whole outside. Let's put a roof on it. Let's move in and live there. Now it's something that, that's applied, and, and that's the picture here. Uh, so, so what he's saying is, not laying aside, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Um, so the picture that he gives, he's just showing the believers that, that the mark of identification, really, of a spiritual life is repentance and faith. What shows me and shows you in your life and should show you that you're identified as growing on to maturity in your spiritual life is that you live a life of repentance and faith, not repentance and works. Lord, I stumbled and I sinned and I blew it and I'm really sorry. I'm trusting your son by faith. Please forgive me. You get up and you go serve your Lord. But some people have this mindset, Lord, I blew it, and now, so now I got to do more to get back into favor with you. I got to go serve. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. You know, I'm, I'm the pastor. I sinned, and now I got to teach your word, and if I ever stop, I'm damned. No, that's, that's dead works because I don't, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. Blessed to do this. So that's what he's showing here. And repentance, simply to change my mind about sin and turn from it, not simply to feel bad about it, because feeling bad about my sin leads to regret and remorse. It's changing my mind about sin to the point of turning from it. Once that happens in my life, then I'm able to exercise faith in God. And faith is the confident assurance of coming good from God. When the foundation is laid down in my life, Jesus Christ, I am trusting him to be saved, period. It's settled. No one's going to take away my salvation and I can't lose my salvation. It's settled there. Then from that, God begins to build. How? He begins to convict me by his word, by his spirit of sin in my life. Now, my sin's forgiven because of the blood of Christ. But he doesn't want me to walk around in pride. He doesn't want me to walk around with a, a selfish attitude. He wants to convict me of those things in my life. So what's he do? He, he gives me his word. He's given me his spirit. I begin to read it. Ooh, 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 that's me. Ooh, I think I need to change in that area. Oh, oh, oh that's it. That's where faith comes in. Faith then steps in. So... So God says, okay, you're convicted. What do you call that? Well, I call it, that's just the way I am because I'm half Italian and French. And God's like, no, okay, we'll, we'll deal with that again. And it comes up again and again and again until you go, you know what, Lord? That's something you want me to repent of. Repent. Change my mind. You call that sin in my life. Maybe not in anybody else's life, but in my life, you're calling it sin. So you want me to change my mind and call it sin and turn from it. You don't want that in my life anymore. Then faith kicks in, and faith is the confident assurance of coming good from God. So when the foundation of the assurance that I have faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior kicks in, I don't sit there and ponder on it. I let God then build me up to maturity on it. And that's what he's trying to show them. It's repentance and faith, and that's when it kicks in. And in verse 2, and of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now these... The doc, this is the doctrines that we ha they have. Um, baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. These are actually Old Testament rituals. This has nothing to do with the New Testament laying on of hands with Timothy or being baptized as a Christian believer. He's speaking about the Old Testament rituals, which were only a shadow of what was to come. They were like the negatives from which a spiritual picture is being developed. They were coming to show Christ. This has nothing to do with if I'm going to raise somebody up into leadership in the church and I call the elders up to lay hands on him. Nothing to do with that. It's the Old Testament rituals that they were going back to. 
And he's saying, leave those things behind. You didn't get saved so you could become religious. And I hate to say that because back in the 1800s, uh, they talked about their own Christian faith as religious, and it was very serious. But today, people talk about religion. There's so many forms of religion, it's insane. And people call themselves Christian uh, in that. So these are the Old Testament rituals. So the, what the writers here is saying is it's far time for you to leave these Old Testament things aside and now build your life up on the resurrected Christ who is a living Christ who fulfilled the Old Testament law, who is our great high priest. It's far time to now trust him to bring you on to maturity to leaving all these things behind. It's time to let them go. It's time to move on. And then in verse 3, he says, and if, we, if this we will do, if God permits. So the lesson here in these verses is simple. Once you've learned to trust God on the foundation God has given you to know him, that is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. There's no other way. Once that happens, you're saved. Then you need to learn the ABCs of your Christian faith. And once you've learned the ABCs of your Christian faith, then you learn how to apply his word to your life, and it changes who you are personally. Because now God is then conforming you into the image of his son. But if I go back to dead works and try to accomplish it on my own, it's going to go nowhere. And, and, and my Christian life goes nowhere then. It, and that's when your Christian life really begins to move forward. That's where you really begin to let God teach you and carry you along to maturity. Some of us have, are not the people we were 10 years ago in our Christian walk. Either we've grown closer in our trust in Christ Oh, we've gone on to maturity. We've learned how to let things go. We've, we've seen God's revealed. That's sin. Well, oh, so it's not sin in their life. We're not there. It's sin in your life. Let it go. Change your mind. Move on. And then you begin to grow. And you actually can look back and see it was the hand of God challenging you every step of the way. That had nothing to do with your salvation. That's happening because you're saved. You can't lose your salvation. That means in the sanctification process, as far as God has to go to open my eyes to repentance of something in my life, he will go that far. How far has, gone, has God gone with you to open your eyes about something in your life personally that he's been showing you, that sin in your life? And you come to that place, you go, okay, you're right, it is. I just have to admit that to you, Lord, and turn from it. And it's not about my willpower. It's not about my strength. It's about obedience to the applied word of God to my life. And when that step is taken, watch out, because God begins to do things in, in great and mighty ways. And, and that's, where the writer, that's what the writer is trying to say here. Then in verse 4, 4 through 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible again to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify themselves to the Son of God and put him to open shame. These are the verses that people use to manipulate others uh, in legalistic churches and don't ever get caught up in that. Um, these verses over the years have been so misunderstood and misapplied. They've actually been used to stumble believers from walking out God's will in their life. Let's get real important because the argument here is, well, if a person is almost saved or not really saved, like they said it with their mouth, but they didn't mean it with their heart. Is that the kind of person we're talking about here? Because once you're saved, how can you not be saved? What, what's this saying? Well, let's look at it, okay? Those who have been enlightened. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, that term means illuminated Jesus as Messiah. Means means to those whose eyes have been opened and they see Jesus as the Messiah. 
and tasted of the heavenly gift. That means received him as their savior being pardoned of their sin. It speaks of a person who is then justified by Jesus Christ's righteousness. Then who have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. That means united with the Holy Spirit. That speaks of being born again. And have tasted the good word of God. That means the scriptures of truth. Means having been convicted and instructed by the word of God. And and the powers of taste of the powers of the age to come means the power of God to receive incorruption and immortality. It speaks boldly of an intimate relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So who's who's being spoken about here? Someone who's saved. Someone who is born again. Someone who has received the Holy Spirit and their eyes have been opened and enlightened to who Jesus is and what he did in their life personally and has developed an intimate relationship with God. That's exactly who he's talking about. And he says, "And, and have tasted of this and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. This fallen away is the word apostatize. An apostatize, a willing abandonment of your faith in Christ. So who he's talking about here is people who have once tasted salvation, received the Holy Spirit, people who are born again, people who have been convicted and instructed by the Word of God in their life and yet have willingly abandoned their faith in Him. That's a frightening thing. That's what apostasy is. Now, apostasy and backsliding are two different worlds, white and black completely. Apostasy is abandoning your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. When you walk in apostasy, you first have to be saved, or you can't walk in apostasy. If someone who's not saved, they can't walk in apostasy. How do you abandon your faith in Christ if you're not saved? You can't. So someone who's walking in apostasy has to first be saved. Then they have to abandon their faith in Jesus Christ. And the only way to do that is rejecting him as the only way God gave them to be saved. That's a frightening place to be. I would not. There are many prodigals who have gone down that road. Okay, many. And if their heart stops beating while they're on that road, where do they end up for eternity? In hell. That is no joke. You go, once saved, always saved. Not if you reject Christ. And that's what he's saying here. You know, God, what he's not saying is that God will not forgive someone who repents. That's not what he's saying. He's saying anyone who's dumb enough, after walking intimately with Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit, and being touched and illuminated by God of what Jesus did and who he is. Anybody dumb enough to to reject that has rejected the way of salvation. And if you openly reject the way of salvation, you don't go to heaven. But that's not the point that he's making here. Now, let me just touch on this. Backsliding, apostasy, two different worlds. Backsliding is stumbling in sin and then repenting over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. That's backsliding. That doesn't touch your salvation. That has nothing to do with salvation. That's someone who just can't get it right or someone that just doesn't want to hear God or someone that doesn't want to grow up and move on to maturity. That's what backsliding is. And and that's what he's showing here. So when you walk as a backslider, you find out that your spiritual life will begin to be filled with shame and sorrow in such a way as that you won't be able to handle it. And you fall down and you cry out, Lord, forgive me. Why do I keep going down this road? Lord, forgive me. You get back up and you make it back to church sometime that month or year or whatever. And then you sit down, you hear the word, you're convicted. Oh, Lord, I'm back with you. Praise God. I feel the power. I feel the strength. And you go right back home and put the thing on and watch. And you're like, oh, I crashed again. And over, it's this repeated cycle. That's backsliding. 
When you, when you backslide and you live a life of backsliding, you blame others because no one sees things your way. And you never really lead anyone to the resurrected life of Christ in you. You only lead people towards your own personal interests and towards your own personal desires while proclaiming to everyone that you're being led by God when you're not. Now, when you're a backslider, you don't lose your salvation because no one can lose their salvation. Get it? No one can lose their salvation. And I got into my truck the other day. I'm like, oh, my salvation, it's gone, where'd it go? I called my wife, have you seen my salvation? I, I don't know where it is. You can't lose your salvation. But, but what he's saying here, in apostasy, someone who apostatizes, turns willingly away, abandons their faith in Christ. And I don't know, if you receive the Holy Spirit, you've been touched by God and you've been convicted by His Word, and you apostatize, that means you reject, you then reject His Word, you reject Him, and you reject Him as Savior. And there's only one place you're going to go when eternity shows up, and that's what He's saying. So, this is the picture. Apostasy is not losing your salvation. It's willingly turning away from it. But the important thing is that's not the point he's making here. He's given the believers there a warning. If someone would be so foolish as to come to know Christ and to trust Him as their Savior, and then to be born again and be filled with His Spirit, be convicted by His Word, and be instructed by His Word. If someone is that foolish enough, then to turn from Him. Then what he's saying is, then it's impossible to renew them to repentance, uh, literally um, because their heart has become so hard it can't even consider repenting because they refuse to acknowledge anymore in their lives that Jesus Christ is their Savior. What he's saying is, it's not God's heart that turns hard against you. It's your heart that turns hard against Him. I would rather live my life, my Christian life, by faith in Christ as my salvation than to try to do it by works. Because if I have to live my life by works, I'm going to lie to you and I'm going to lie to God. Because I'm going to put on a show to make it look good. And that's living two lives. That's not what God wants. But walking by faith in Christ, I know full well I'm a sinner and I know full well you're a sinner. That's why when people come into my office and they go, i got to confess something to you, I don't go, <gasps> really? How could that be? I didn't think that about you. No, I think that about everybody. Why? Because I know what I am. And I know the salvation that's been given to me, and I have the assurance of that salvation by my faith in Christ alone. And from that, God has begun to work on that foundation in my life, and He's built a couple rooms in a roof, a place where someone can stay warm, someone can come in and be comfortable, a place where someone come in and partake and feed, and in all of that. And that's what He's doing in each and every one of us. And that's an amazing thing. So, so the point he makes here in these verses is not, can you lose your salvation? That's the argument of the church, and it shouldn't even be an argument. The point he's making is, you, if, you wanna, if someone's foolish enough to turn from Christ after all of that knowing him, their heart will become so hard, they'll reject him. And if they reject him, where do they end up? And I wouldn't want to be living a life that has known Christ and then rejected him, and yet God will never stop in hearts like that trying to convict them. He'll never stop trying to show them, trying to direct them back to his son. He'll never stop. You know, we see a picture of that in the Old Testament with, with, the, with the nation of Judah just before their captivity in Babylon. They've come to a place where they don't want to hear the word of God. They don't want to hear God's prophets. They reject God's word and they run headlong after all these other things. And what did God say last week? I'm going to judge you. In fact, I'm going to judge you individually. 
You'll stand before me as a nation. But don't you think for one second, you, you won't stand before me individually. And what does the Bible teach us? That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess individually that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So if you're here today and you're saved, you be settled in that fact right now. Be settled in it. Hey, Lord, you know what? You want to build off that foundation. And it's going to be done by repentance and faith. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pick it up. I'm not going to read any other garbage. I'm going to read your word. And your word, and then by the Spirit, you're going to convict me of sin in my life, and I'm going to turn from that sin, trusting your Son by faith. And you're going to grow me. You're going to mature me. You're going to strengthen me in you. And that's how God does it. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to show, show these Jewish people. Look at verse 7. For the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it was also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, he says it's worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Again, these verses are used by a lot of legalistic churches to back up what he just said, if you've lost your salvation, if you can't be saved. Oh, look, now you're going to burn. That's what he's saying, right? No, that's not what he's saying. The writer of Hebrews is saying his focus is not whether or not you could lose your salvation. The focus for these Jewish believers is to not turn back to Judaism. The focus is we have a great high priest. So press on and trust him by faith. Keep moving forward and continue to allow God the freedom to bring you on to maturity. And if you'll do that, your life is going to bear fruit. That's what he's saying here. If you, if you let God bring you on to maturity, your life will bear fruit. Now listen, if you don't let God bring you on to maturity, your life will bear fruit also, but it won't be good. It'll be bad fruit. If you, if you let God from your salvation, you settle in that, and then God begins to, to, to show you from his word to repent in something, you turn from it, agree with God, and turn from it. And then trust Christ by faith. God then begins to build you up on the foundation of Christ in your life. And when that happens, it bears fruit. Having patience with others while God is forming them into the image of his son is one of the fruits. Would you love it if while God is sanctifying you, and molding you into the image of Christ, if everybody else in the fellowship just unconditionally loved you no matter what you went through? Amen. You know, I just, sometimes I fly off the handle. And the other day I was there and I picked up Mindy's symbol and I threw it across the thing. And Mindy was like, well, run, don't worry. It's not a big deal. I know you're being sanctified too. Thank you. Thank you. It, one of the fruits of spiritual maturity is having patience with others while God is forming them into the image of his son. One of the fruits also is the willingness to lay down your own opinion and unconditionally love others that don't have the opinion you have. Let it go. Put it down. Lay it down. Another fruit is the ability to control your appetites and hungers before others who don't know any better. You know, the church needed a microphone. So I got a microphone. I got one at home, but I brought it in. Here's the church's microphone. And five other people come in. I have a microphone too. I have a microphone too. Instead of arguing about the microphone, why don't you say, wow, praise God, we got six microphones. <laughs> praise the Lord. How many people we got in the worship team? You all get a new microphone. <laughs> praise God. That's how it works. Is, is, is understanding the ability to control your own appetites and hungers, um, before others who don't know any better. Why did Jesus say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why did he say that? He doesn't lie, because he, they didn't know what they were doing. If they knew he was the Son of God, the Savior of the world, they wouldn't have done that. But they had to do that. They had to not know what they were doing. For Jesus to be crucified on that cross. 
So he could look down from the cross and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They will find out one day. But right now they don't know. Another fruit is being gentle instead of demanding or choose your own rights or choosing humility instead of manipulating your way as, as some others do, right? So what he's showing here is, so to refuse to be brought on to maturity, to refuse that will also bear fruit. That's where he talks about the burning here, which what will be if, I'm, if I refuse to let, I'm going to stay a Christian, not losing my salvation, but I'm going to live as a backslider because I can't meet God's rules and regulations. No, meaning I won't let God bring me on to maturity because I love my life right now and I don't want to change. But if I want, if I refuse to let him bring me on to maturity, it will bear fruit in my life. And the fruit that it will bear will be deceit, deception, selfishness, and misery for you and for those around you. Because you'll deceive yourself. And you'll be caught up in yourself. You'll be thinking in the back of your mind, I'm the greatest person, I'm, I'm good, I don't know why people... Ever. And you're deceiving yourself the whole time. Because that's, that's fruit it bears. And so, to backslide is to not allow God to bring me on to maturity. To apostatize is to refuse and abandon my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. One will bring me to heaven without bearing fruit, true. One will bring me to hell. Whether I proclaimed Christ as Savior or received His Holy Spirit or was born again. And, that, and, and the picture painted here, a graphic one, but very important. The key verse of the whole chapter is right here in verse 9. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. Though we are speaking in this way, saying, oh, listen, I'm speaking pretty tough and it's not easy to receive what I'm saying. But I'm speaking that way because, beloved, I'm con we're con convicted of better things concerning you. He's saying, we believe that you'll never abandon your faith. I I'm speaking this way and it's hard for you to receive, but I don't believe you will abandon your faith. That's what he's saying. There's better things I'm convicted of you with. Um, and he calls them beloved. You know, he doesn't call them Jews. He calls them beloved. Beloved means you who are loved by God. So he doesn't refer to them as Jews, which would be a descendant of Abraham. It means, but as God's elect, those who are loved with an everlasting love. That's beloved. Listen, beloved. We're convicted in, 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 uh, concerning you. There's a conviction in my heart. And I'm speaking heavy like this because I don't believe you would abandon your faith. But I'm not going to toss it aside. And I speak this way, in, in that light. You know, we, we say it to our children in, in different words when they're small. We say, don't talk to a stranger. Why, they may pick you up and steal you and kill you and rape you. And, oh, you're scared. What are they going to do? Oh, strangers, that's what they're all going to do. No. I speak this way. It's graphic. It's hard to receive it. I don't want you to get in the car with a stranger. I don't want you to get hurt. I love you enough to speak the truth. Remember I've shared with you, I think Pete and I have shared many stories about the loving discipline of my mom and dad. <laughs> and many of you had mom and dads who lovingly disciplined you. You know, when the belt comes out and you know, you're already running. I remember the day I told my dad, you won't catch me. I think I was 12. I looked at him right in the face, and I, was, I did something really bad. I looked at him. I pulled his belt out. I said to him, <laughs> I remember it to this day. You can't, you won't catch me. And I turned to run. That's as far as I got. I was shocked. I thought I'd at least make it to the pool, you know. <laughs> I, only, I only got a turning. Wait, he got me, man. But lovingly disciplined me. I can't sit down to this day, but he lovingly disciplined me. W what he's saying here is I, these words I, I give you, they, they may be heavy, but I, I'm convinced that you're not going to abandon your faith. There's better things I'm thinking of you. Things of being brought on to maturity. So I speak heavy like this because it's a warning from God. 
Leave, leave the old life behind. And step on to this foundation of Christ in your life and sanctified and saved and, and then let God build up on that. Nothing else. And that's what he's showing them there. And he says, the convicts of better things. Better things speaks of leaving the works of religion behind you and pressing on in the grace of God. And it's the grace of God is what makes a better man. There's no society on earth that can make a man better. None. You might learn how to do good things, but you'll never be better because what is every man on earth before God? A sinner who needs salvation. Then you don't make a sinner better outside of the grace of God and the salvation that he gives. It's the grace of God that makes a man fruitful. The grace of God is lasting. The grace of God will, will abide the fires of persecution. The grace of God is salvation. And he says, we think of better things, things that accompany salvation. And that's why we're speaking this way. And the things that accompany salvation, it speaks of following one another in the chain of salvation or being mixed together with one another in the ingredients of salvation. We're all, it's individual, but we're all in this together. We're speaking, speaking to you of the things of salvation. You know, put it in. And God says, okay, a little bit of salt over here, a little bit of pepper here, some paprika there. you got your garlic powder and your chives, and, and we're going to put you all together and, man, pull you out to this place. And we go, Lord, I just want you to use me. But you threw me into this bag with salt and pepper, and I'm garlic. And everybody knows I'm garlic. God's like, yeah, but mixed together and poured out over dumplings, it's delicious. It's me. And we get all caught up individually of what we are, and God's saying, there's a, there's a better thing that I'm working here. I'm working behind the scenes. Guess who's brought us all together? And if my eyes are on me, guess who's going to believe I, I shouldn't be a part of this? I'm not godly enough to be a part of this. I'm not good enough to be a part of this. And yet God's saying, I brought you here because I know who you are and I know where I'm going with you and with all of you. Let me do my work. Let me in. Let me, let me do my work in you. And, and it's a place to be. And that's what he's pushing, you know, uh, that we would be maturing together in faith and growing together in his love, growing together in understanding really what predestination means, in understanding our justification, understanding our adoption, understanding our sanctification, and then ultimately understanding our glorification. What does that really mean? And what's nice is we've been able to walk through that in all the Word. When you walk through it uh, expositorily, you touch all those subjects. And, we, and it covers them all, and it, it's a blessed place. In verse, in verse 10, he says, um, For God is not unjust as to forget your work and the love which you have showed towards his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints, right? So he's, what he speaks of here is their work and labor of love. And it's important to note here that our work and labor of love won't save us, but if we are saved, this is why we're rewarded in heaven. We're rewarded from the work of labor and love we do here on earth. That work doesn't save us. That's where our rewards come from. And, and the rewards, again, remember this, jewels in my crown. Where's my crown go in heaven? It doesn't parade on my head. It's thrown down at the feet of Christ where it belongs. All these rewards you've given me, thank you, Lord. But the truth is, it had nothing to do with me. It's all you. And we lay it right down at his feet. And that's what he speaks about here. Though they have nothing to do with our salvation, they're a very important part of a believer's life. In verse 11, And we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope unto the end. Okay, so you're pardoned by God because of Jesus. And what he's saying is, so now learn to exercise his grace to others and your assurance will become stronger and stronger and stronger. And the one thing we all need is the full assurance of hope unto the end. Though I have the hope of heaven in my heart, guess what I need every day? The full assurance of it. 
And how do I get that? By learning to exercise His grace to others. The same grace you give me every moment of my life as I'm learning to mature in my walk with Christ. The same grace I want you to hand out to others. Because who am I above? Nobody. Nobody. We all come under Him. And then in verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises there. So what he's saying is God has made a lot of promises to us as believers. And just like all who came before us, when we walk by faith and we endure in Christ, we walk in the inheritance of his promises. If I'm going to walk as a backslider, guess what I'm not walking in? The inheritance of his promises. One of, one of the inheritance of his promise is his mercy's fresh every day. So why don't I wake up and say, thank you for your mercy. Yesterday doesn't exist in your eyes. I can press right on and walk into today by your grace. Should be done every single day of our lives. Put yesterday behind us. And I should not fear tomorrow because it doesn't exist yet. Amazing. So, so he, a tremendous picture that's painted there for us there. Look at verse 13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could not swear by no one greater, uh, he swore by himself. You know, when people make an oath and they're going to make you a promise and they swear by something greater. I, I promise on my mother's name or whatever you want to say something greater than I, I promise on a stack of Bibles. I promise on the truth that I'm going to speak it. Well, how, who's greater than God? So God's like, I promise on my name. <laughs> okay, then, then he made a promise there. <laughs> he says, for men swear by one greater than themselves and with them an oath given as a confirmation of every dispute. In verse 17. He says, and in the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his promise interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, right? Where Jesus has entered as forerunner. We'll look at that. So what he's saying here is, you know, there's no one greater than God, so God swore by himself. What did he do? He made a promise to Abraham that he would not break that promise. Abraham, look up at the stars. If you can count them all, <laughs> that's how many children you're going to have. Really, I'm a hundred and you know, I don't even have a child yet. Look up. Here's my promise. You'll have more than the stars you can count. And Abraham could only look up and see with his eyes. We know how many more stars are out there. It's uncountable, right? And that's his promise. He, he said, I make you that promise. And what did Abraham do? He patiently endured. And because he patiently endured, trusting God by faith in the promise that he gave, every day he got a fresh assurance that came to him by trusting God by faith. If I want my assurance of salvation secured, I've got to trust God by faith. And when he shows me something, to trust him that he knows what he's doing. Either repent of something or change direction, whatever it might be. So when you trust God, you walk with him, when you trust God in that way, you grow in the grace and knowledge of him. And then through the study of his word, um, you begin to mature in him. And that's what brings you to a place of an assurance that cannot be shaken. Abraham, I promise you, look up. That's how many children you're going to have. I believe you, Lord. A year goes by. I believe you, Lord. A few years go by. One child. I believe you, Lord. One child passes away. I believe you, Lord. God says, that, that's a righteous man. And how, we look back, and God's given us, what, thousands of years. How many children did Abraham have? It's uncountable. We could, we, you couldn't count every born-again believer on earth today. And every born-again believer on earth 70 years ago, 100 years ago. 200, 
300, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. Uncountable. Uncountable. That's how many children Abraham had. That was the promise of God uh, being a, uh, given a light unto the Gentiles. And, and he says, in the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of his promises the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath. Now, that God can't lie. So, so when, when God does something, God doesn't need to make an oath to the promises that he makes. Why? Because he's God. But he chose to take an oath so that he made it very clear to Abraham how important it was. So God made an oath. And, and these are the two unchangeable things. That God promised Abraham descendants as innumerable as the stars. And to back that promise up, he later confirmed his promise to Abraham by making an oath to Abraham. Abraham, I promise you. Thank you, Lord. Then he came back and made a covenant with him, made an oath to him, a physical agreement with him, and said, Abraham, there, I back up that promise by an oath, and I back it up by myself. And I cannot lie. And he knows that. And what it did is it gave Abraham the encouragement and the assurance to trust God by faith because Abraham understood that God could not lie. And as believers today, we have two unchangeable things given to us by God. Not only do we have the promise made by God to Abraham for our encouragement, we have a far richer revelation of God's love that's the gift of His Son. He's given us His Son. The two unchangeable things we have, we have the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we have His ascension and intercession for us. Did Jesus die on the cross? You who are saved, yes or no? Yes. All right, you know that by faith, according to the word of God, none of us were there to see it. Yet we believe God at his word. And the more we believe him at his word, the stronger the assurance comes to us that I could stand here before a row of guns and say, Jesus died on that cross and rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven and where he is right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Go ahead and pull the trigger because those are truths I will never deny. And those are the two unchangeable promises that, has given, that he's given to us. So we have four facts given to us of an assurance that will provide a refuge that we can tangibly take hold of. That's why this hope becomes an anchor for my soul. Though I stumble, though I trip, though I'm, I, I struggle with sin and wrestle with the, the world and the flesh and the devil today, there's an anchor in my soul. And the anchor is Christ, Jesus, my great high priest, my living God who gave his life for me, rose from the dead, and now intercedes to himself for me. Settled in that. Something solid and tangible I can hold on to and God can build upon. It becomes an anchor to the soul. That's what he's saying. We have an even stronger encouragement than Abraham had in his time because our great high priest has entered in advance into the presence of God for us and he's still there today interceding for us. So is this chapter about once saved, always saved? No. It's a warning to not go backwards when God has called us to move forward onto maturity. And as we begin to do that, we gain an assurance of our salvation. It becomes stronger and solid and more secure each and every step of the way. That's why he says in verse 20, um, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And that's an important picture too. The order of Melchizedek is simply the irrevocable agreement that God made with Israel, giving them a priesthood in a sacrificial system, which was all a picture of Christ, a picture of how God would, would see a high priest raised up for eternity where we could be forgiven and that forgiveness would become an assurance to us. 
Jesus did. So when Jesus ascended back into heaven, he assumed the office of a great high priest entering for us within the veil, and he sat down. You know what that means? That means he's finished our redemption. Nothing more needs to be done. So faith in him is all that's required for this whole thing to begin. Repentance and faith. And it's trusting him in that and for that. God begins then to bring me on to maturity and all that. So I look at this and it's like, what a picture in his word for us. Let me explain it this way. You and I have been brought to court by God and found guilty by him. And the penalty of our sin was death. Then Jesus came and he bore the penalty for us because he died in our place. And you and I, by faith in him, have been set free. We've been delivered from the penalty of sin and death. And we never, ever have to answer for it again. It's done. It's complete. And now intercedes for us. And we trust in him with that. So what that does is it sets me free to go and serve him. And the assurance I have of my salvation, if I stumble, if I get tripped up, if I find myself falling short, I have an eternal great high priest. I have a resurrected Savior to whom I can go. I've been given a throne of grace in which I've been given full liberty to speak with God and to know that He hears me and cares about me. What an amazing picture the writer of the book of Hebrews gives to us today. Nothing to do. You're saved. You settle in that fact. And, and I'm assured. I have, I'm convicted with an assurance that you want better things in your salvation than to turn from faith in Christ. I'm settled in that. And that's what the writers say. And if you're going to go drift that way, your heart's going to get hard. And if it gets hard, it can become so hard, it will refuse to repent, and it'll abandon faith in Christ and reject Christ. And we know what happens to hearts that reject Christ. So his focal point is not really that verse. It's saying it to shake him up with a warning and then giving them the encouragement to trust in the promises that God made for us. Christ died, he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is interceding for us right now. The assurance of that given to us. So, so that's really what he's doing. The writer of this book in this chapter is doing two things. He's warning the Jewish believers not to turn back to Judaism, but to move forward, pressing on in their faith in Christ. And he's encouraging them by, I guess, proving to them that the promises of God are true and sure and can be trusted and walked out by faith each and every day. And I think that directly applies to us each and every moment of our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, thank you for the incredible grace that you give us each and every day. The incredible gift of salvation given to us through your Son. And then offering us, Lord, even faith when we had none to believe in Him and to trust in Him. Lord Jesus, I thank You for loving us in the way that You have and that You continue to do. Thank You for interceding for us. Lord, take Your Word that was taught today and plant it deep in every heart and let it be watered by Your Holy Spirit. Let it take root quickly so the enemy could not steal it away. Settle it deep, Lord, and let it bear fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.